welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a lesson on remote management. In this lesson, we'll get things started by taking a look at Global Mantic's needs when it comes to remote management. Then I'll show you how to install a Windows 7 client computer. We will then join that client to the globalmantics.local domain. We will enable remote desktop or really I should say we'll revisit the enabling of remote desktop because we already turned on remote desktop on our two servers so far and but then we'll come back to the Windows 7 client and we'll create a remote desktop connection to those servers and then I'll show you another form of remote management which is called the remote server administration tool so we'll see how to get that installed for remote administration So, in an effort to work more efficiently, Global Mantics wants to create an environment which will allow its IT administrators to manage the company's servers without having to get up from their desk. This, I can tell you, is actually quite typical. Uh, I, here at TrainSignal, am one of the IT administrators, and it is very rare that I go into the server room. Remote management allows me to sit at my desk and still manage the servers. Well, Global Mantics is looking to do the same thing. Now, this will also increase the security of our servers in the server room because there's less traffic going in and out. So besides the benefit of not having to get up from your desk and therefore being more comfortable, being more efficient, etc., etc., there are also increased security benefits with remote management. So similar to the previous lesson, we're going to kind of get just right into it. We're going to go right in and see how things work. And we're going to get our Windows 7 client installed. So on the screen, I have the tasks that are involved for installing Windows 7. And similar to installing Windows Server 2008, Microsoft has really simplified this process. I mean, you need to boot from your installation media. So we'll be booting from a Windows 7 DVD. You need to select an installation language, click the Install Now button. Those are exactly the same as what we saw with Windows Server 2008. Now one difference here is we don't have to pick a version like we did with Windows Server 2008. It's just plain Windows 7. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into accepting the license terms. That We then have to choose either custom installation or upgrade. And since this is going to be a clean installation, it needs to be a custom installation. We will then have to select and or format a hard drive or partition to install Windows 7 onto. And then for the rest of the time, we just sit back and relax and wait for it to go through the rest of its processes and, and reboots. Now, after those processes and reboots are done, here comes part two. So this is kind of after the operating system is installed but still needs to be configured. There's a little mini wizard that will come up. And what we need to do here is create a local user account and computer name. Now this gets a little confusing for people because if we're thinking about this computer being used in a domain, why would we create a user account? Well, it, it's kind of something you have to do as part of the basic Windows 7 installation. Now there are more advanced ways of doing things where we can avoid this, but here we're going to look at this just from a raw, you know, stick the DVD in and what do we have to do? Create a local user account, which will just be there but we won't worry about once we join the domain and give the computer a name then we need to create a password for that local user account we need to configure automatic updates configure our time and date settings assign a network location now assuming that you have a network card in the computer and that you have some form of DHCP in place so that you get an IP address it's going to prompt you for what type of network are you on. Are you on a home network, a work network, or a public network? So that's what we're referring to there. And then lastly, we need to go in and activate Windows. So why don't we go ahead and get this all done now. So here we are once again at VMware Workstation just as we did in the last lesson when we were installing Windows Server 2008. But now I have another new virtual machine that I've created. 
and this machine is going to be Windows 7. It's going to be actually a 64-bit version of Windows 7 Enterprise Edition. You can actually see that here from the DVD that I already have in the drive. This is the identical computer to what we had with Windows Server 2008 in the sense that it has 1 gig of RAM and an 80 gig hard drive. And again, I'll point out that the network adapter is bridged so that it can communicate with the other virtual machines. Now this is important because of course this client, when it comes time to joining the domain, is going to have to be able to communicate with the Global Mantics domain controllers. I should also mention that both New York DC1 and New York DC2 are up and running. Okay, so uh, it really won't matter for this initial installation, but for the joining of the domain, which we are going to do in this lesson, you're going to have to have at least one of those domain controllers up and running in order to have everything work. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and start the virtual machine. And again, similar to what we've seen before, you might see the screen kind of shift in size a little bit. And the reason why is because on a virtual machine, when you're first installing the operating system, you're going to have different screen resolutions. Uh, I'll try to minimize it as much as possible. But anyway, here you'll notice that because there is no operating system on this computer, it boots off of the DVD. That's the only option it has. If it already had an operating system, then you would have gotten a message across the top saying press any key to boot from CD or DVD and you'd have to press the any key in order to go ahead and have it boot off the DVD instead of the existing operating system. Alright so here we go it went right into the installation utility on the DVD I have to pick an installation language and so of course I speak English here in the United States so I'm gonna leave everything exactly the way it is go ahead and click next here's our install now button and now the actual installation setup wizard is starting. This will take just a moment. And there we go. The next thing you have to do is go ahead and accept the license terms. Click next. We have to choose whether we're going to upgrade or do a custom, which we have to do custom because this is going to be a new copy of Windows. We're not upgrading from anything. So I'll click that. Again, we need to select a disk and or partition to install onto. I have a single 80 gig hard drive. No reason, nothing incenting me to create separate partitions. On a client in a production environment, you may have a typical scenario where maybe you divide this hard drive into two separate partitions, one which will have the operating system, the other which has data. That's not that uncommon. But I don't have any specific motivational reason here with Global Mantics. That's not a corporate policy that's been established. We're not worried about that right now. So we're just going to go ahead and install on the 80 gig hard drive. So all I have to do is click next. And what do we do at this point? That's right. We sit back and relax. It needs to copy Windows files, expand the Windows files, install features and updates, and then complete the installation. And it tells you right here, that's all we need. The computer will restart several times, and then installation will be complete. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording while this finishes all the different processes. And when we get to the next screen with the little setup wizard after installation, I will go ahead and resume this lesson. And if you're trying to follow along, please pause the lesson as well. And then when you get to that screen, go ahead and resume. We'll be at the same place, and we'll go from there. Okay, it has gone through all the various processes and reboots, and you'll see here that uh, if you were following along, you would have seen that it said Windows was starting up for the first time. So technically, the operating system is installed, although guess what? You're not going to be able to use it until you go through this second half of setup, where you need to go ahead and type a username. So I'm going to actually just go ahead and type in user, okay, because we're not really worried about it we don't have a specific user for this computer and also this computer is going to end up being the member of the globalmantics.local domain so what would typically happen in a production environment is well if you were doing the process this way you weren't using other advanced methods and you had to put in a user uh, what tends to happen is is 
you'll come up with a corporate policy that says that every computer will have this one local administrator account named whatever. You know, it could be local admin as a for instance. Matter of fact, you know what? We'll go ahead and we'll leave it at that. We'll type in local admin. Okay. Now you'll see it defaults here to local admin PC. It, it puts in the username dash PC. Now that's another philosophy that some companies have is they'll go ahead and put in the actual username of the person who's going to be sitting at that computer. So if John were to be sitting at this computer, they would put in John and then that way it would say John PC. Or if the company's too large and you're worried about having multiple Johns, well then you might put John Smith and then you'd have John Smith PC. The problem I have with doing that is, although I've been guilty of doing that, the problem I have with it is that personnel doesn't always stay the same. So you might have John Smith PC, but then John Smith resigns from the company and Jane Doe comes to work and uses this computer, but it still says John Smith PC unless you take the time to go through and reinstall or change the computer name, et cetera, et cetera. So just want to give you an idea of some of the different philosophies that are out there. I like using the one where you just put that same local administrator account of some name that is decided and it's on every single PC. That way it doesn't matter who's using it. And then we need to go ahead and give the computer an actual name. In this case, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to call this computer New York because this is going to be one of the New York clients. CLI for client 1 dash win 7. Okay, so that's a computer naming convention that I like to use that shows me where is this computer located. Now you might be thinking to yourself, but what if we move the computer to another location? Yes, that is possible, but computers don't move from location to location very often. We're going to call it client1 because it's the first client that we're setting up in this domain. And Windows set, Win7 for the Windows 7 operating system. Okay, You can use any name you want. Again, just trying to give you an idea of philosophy. So let me go ahead and click Next. Now I have to give a password for this user account. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my super secure password. And because it's my typical super secure password, I'm going to put in typical super secure. Now this wouldn't be a very good idea to use as a password hint because if somebody were to actually hack in and figure out my standard typical super secure password, well then they're going to know on any machine that they go to the hint, oh well, he's using that same one. I know what the local admin password is. So anyway I'll go ahead and click next. Now we need to decide what we want to do with Windows updates and I'm going to go ahead and use the recommended settings which is to go ahead and enable automatic updates having them not only look for them but to download and install them automatically. We're going to go ahead and set that up. That is pretty typical on what you want to do with your clients. Servers, not necessarily. Your servers you may want to go ahead and set them up to be a little bit more manual so you can check out the updates before putting them on. But with your clients, typically, uh, you'll have some kind of an update server or some kind of scenario to where it's usually pretty safe to have your clients automatically update. You don't want to have to rely on the users to go out there and do it. Next, we have to go ahead and set up our time and date settings. So basically, the big issue here is we need to go ahead and put ourselves in the Eastern time zone because this is New York. Click Next. And here... A network was recognized, so we need to say what type of network. Well, we're not at home, and it's not a public network. We're at the Global Matrix corporate office, so we're going to go ahead and say it's a work network. And now Windows will go ahead and finalize the settings. And look at this. It's going to take us right into our desktop for the very first time. Now, the first time it logs into the desktop, it may take just a little while and that's because the very first time it logs on it needs to create that user profile now another thing I want you to notice that's taking place on my computer right now is that it's already downloading and installing updates okay and it's doing this because we told it to enable automatic updates and automatic updates uh, says hey 
we got some stuff for you. So it's it's getting them downloaded and installed. Uh, depending on when exactly you are watching this and you're doing the installation, you may or may not have specific updates to be installed. But while we're waiting for that, there is one more step that needs to be done, and that is we need to go ahead and activate Windows 7. Now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click on Start. And I'm going to go to right click on computer and go to properties. And if I scroll down a little bit here, you'll see here Windows activation, three days till automatic activation. I can choose to activate Windows now. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to click on the link to activate Windows now. I'm going to say, yep, we're online. So let's go ahead and activate Windows online now. You'll notice, by the way, it says I had 30 days. Okay, so that's the evaluation period if I don't do it. Uh-oh, a problem occurred when Windows tried to activate. Well, the reason why, let me go ahead and click close. Oh, look what's happening in the background. It says updates were successfully installed and I need to reboot to actually have them take effect. So I'm going to minimize this window so that I can finish the activation process. The reason this failed is because this particular copy of Windows 7 Enterprise is a volume license edition and it it thinks that it already has a product ID so it just went ahead and tried to activate but it's an invalid ID. So I'm going to change the product key and I need to go ahead and enter in the correct product key so I'll do that now. So I've entered my product key, let me go ahead and click next. And hopefully, if I've entered the correct key, it'll go through and verify it. What it's doing right now is it's going online to Microsoft's activation servers and saying, all right, well, I got I got someone coming in with this product key. They're just basically making sure that this is not a pirated key or a key that's already been used uh, as many times as it's licensed for. Okay, and so this does take just a moment, uh, but it'll go through here and should activate. And there it goes activation was successful so go ahead and click close and then now I can go ahead and close out of my system properties and now the one last thing I'm gonna do before opening up Windows Update and telling it to go ahead and reboot is go ahead and set up the desktop environment so if I right click I can do my screen resolution so if instead of 800 by 600, I think I'm going to go ahead and use 1024 by 768. Make it a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to see. And we'll go ahead and keep the changes. All right, so the screen's a little bit bigger now. Okay, so that pretty much is all we have to do as far as the installation goes. So I'm going to go ahead and click down here and go ahead and tell this to reboot and while the system reboots let's go back and let's talk about the process of joining to the domain so let's just look at the tasks real fast as far as what we need to do when it comes to joining this client to the domain while we're waiting for that reboot and basically here's what you do you open up the system control panel. Now we were actually just in the system control panel. We got there not through control panel, but by right clicking on computer and going to properties. Okay, I'll show you that in just a moment. But then once we're in there, we're gonna click on the change settings link for the computer name, domain, and work group settings section of the system control panel. Once in there, we need to click the change button to rename the computer or change its domain or work group. Then we need to select to be part of a domain as opposed to right now it currently is selected as part of a work group. So we'll select to join a domain and then we have to enter the domain name. So we're going to enter globalmantics.local. And then we're going to have to go ahead and enter our credentials. And the, when I say enter credentials, we're going to have to enter a user from the globalmantics.local domain who has the credentials to be able to allow this computer to join the domain. Now we only have the one user right now, which is the domain administrator account, so that's what we'll use. But after we do that, it should join the domain and all we have to do is reboot. So let's go back to our Windows 7 computer. Hopefully it's done rebooting. And let's go ahead and join the domain. 
All right, so back here on our Windows 7 client computer, it has rebooted, and you'll notice here it's giving us the logon screen for that local admin account we created. So let's go ahead and put in our password and hit enter. And it takes us back into our desktop. Now, the first thing we need to do, I had mentioned, was going to the system control panel. So I could click start and go to control panel, go into system and security, and then here is the actual system control panel. And when I do all that, it takes me into the system control panel. Or, let me close that, I could just simply click start, right click computer, and go to properties. It takes me to the same place. Doesn't matter which way you go. Personally, I like right clicking computer properties a little bit faster, a little bit easier, it's up to you. Anyway, here in the system properties, you'll see here's the computer name, domain, and workgroup settings section. Right now it says New York Client 1, Windows 7. It's part of a workgroup. I'm going to click to change settings. This opens up the true system properties window. So here I need to rename the computer or change its domain or workgroup. So I'm going to click on change. And you'll see it's currently the member of a workgroup. I'm going to go ahead and try to make it a member of the globomantics.local domain. Now I want to tell you, this may not work. Matter of fact, I'm expecting that it won't work. And there is a very specific reason which I'm going to show you. Let, let's try it though, because I want to see if it works. And if we get, we may get lucky. And then if we do, I'll explain why. Either way, I'll show you the mistake that we currently have in place. So let me go ahead and click OK. And you'll see here it says that we can't locate an Active Directory domain controller for that particular domain. Now the reason why, and this is something I talked about in the last lesson, we need to make sure that we have DNS set up to support this scenario. And although, yes, we do have our domain controllers installed and they're up and running and they are DNS servers as well, and we've already verified that the SRV resource records are in DNS to locate the domain, there is a problem. And I mentioned it in the last lesson, and that is that both the client and those servers need to be looking to the same DNS server. Okay, the problem we have right now, if I go ahead and click start, and I'm just going to type CMD, okay, which will open up a command prompt window. And if I type IP config, which shows our Windows TCP IP configuration, and I'm going to put forward slash all, okay, which will, which will show the entire configuration. Now it shows a lot of stuff here, but I'm going to scroll up just a little bit because what I want you to see is we are currently a DHCP client. That's how Windows 7 is set up by default. And the router on my network is configured to give out IP addresses. So I've received an IP address on the 192.168.10 network, gave me .105. That was apparently the next available IP address in that particular range. But right down here where it says DNS servers, the DNS servers are actually pointing to a couple of DNS servers. You'll notice they're not even on the same subnet as me. These are DNS servers which are used to get out to the internet but are not configured to support the globalmantics.local Active Directory domain. Okay, these are DNS servers that are used here at TrainSignal to get out to the internet. So what I need to do is go ahead and close this command prompt window. And now I'm gonna go ahead and click start. And I'm gonna go back to my control panel. And I'm gonna go to network and internet. I'm going to go to the Network and Sharing Center, and then Change Adapter Settings. I'm going to right-click on Local Area Connection, go to Properties. Similar to what we did in Windows Server 2008 R2, I'm going to clear the checkbox for IP version 6. We're not worried about that for right now. I'm going to highlight IP version 4 and go to Properties. Now, there's a couple of choices that I have. I could set this client up statically. 
but there's really not a need to do that because we do have a DHCP server issuing IP addresses. The problem is, is that that particular DHCP server is pointing to the wrong DNS servers. Now I could go to the DHCP server and tell it to issue the correct DNS servers, but I don't want to do that because this particular router services other computers in my local network here, which don't need to point to the global Mantix DNS servers. So what I'm going to do is, since I have a DHCP server which is handing out IP addresses, but just the wrong DNS server, I'm going to say statically use a specific DNS server. So it's here that I'm going to put in 192.168.10.201. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and since I know I have two DNS servers, I'm going to put in the alternate DNS server of 202, okay, 192.168.10.202. Now, if you're trying to follow along, your settings may not be identical to mine. Okay, It depends on how specific you're getting with your environment as we've been going along through everything with the way I have mine set up. But the one part that is key, it is absolutely vital to this all working, is that your domain controllers need to point to the same DNS servers as your client. So let me go ahead and click OK and close this window and close out of this window and that brings us back to here where I get my error message about not being able to locate this domain controller so I'm going to click OK and now that DNS is pointing to the right place I'm going to try once again to click OK and, jo and join the globalmantics.local domain and this time you'll notice it prompts me for credentials meaning it did locate the domain so I'm going to go ahead and put in administrator and my secret password. You'll notice the domain is for globalmantics.local, so it is that administrator account that we're logging in with. I'm going to click OK. And it'll take just a moment here. What it's doing is it's actually creating a computer account for this Windows 7 computer. It now welcomes me to, isn't it so polite? Welcome to the globalmantics.local domain. Click OK. I'm going to click OK. It just tells me I must restart in order for this to truly take effect. So I'll click OK. Close this window. And it says you must restart. So I'm going to go ahead and click to restart now. OK, so I'll reboot the computer. And while it's rebooting, I'm going to switch over to New York DC1. OK, that's what we're looking at here is New York DC1. And on New York DC1, I'm going to click Start and go to Active Directory, Users, and Computers. And the reason why is because while we're rebooting, I'm going to verify that a computer account truly was created for the Windows 7 client. All right. And actually, the last time we were in this utility, the last thing we had clicked on was the computer's container. So that was already highlighted. And sure enough, in that container, which was empty if you remember that from the last lesson this was an empty container we now have the New York client 1 Windows 7 computer account that is where all computer accounts will go by default or I should say all non domain controller accounts right because here in the domain controllers container is where we can see New York DC 1 and New York DC 2 but all non domain controller computer accounts will go to the default computers container in an upcoming lesson I will show you how to create additional containers and maybe get a little more organized than just put all your computer accounts in a single container. But anyway, let me go ahead and close Active Directory, Users and Computers. And let's go back to our Windows 7 client and see if it's done rebooting. Okay, looks like it has finished rebooting. And you'll notice this time, instead of taking us right to a logon screen, remember that's what we had last time we rebooted? Now it says press control alt delete to log on and it does that because I'm now in a domain environment. Now one thing that is different here than what we saw with Windows Server 2008 with the domain controllers is that it does not automatically default to logging in with a global Mantix user account. Okay, here it's still looking to log in as the New York client one Windows 7 local admin account so I would have to click switch user and say I want to log in as other user and then put in administrator 
And you'll notice, by the way, when you put in the name administrator, because there is a built-in administrator account on this machine, the log onto just changed. I don't know if you saw that. Let me let me backspace one character. Now it's logging onto Global Mantics. As soon as I put in administrator, logs onto the local computer. So it's very important that you actually type in Global Mantics backslash administrator and then put in the password. And now it will log on with the Global Mantics administrator account. All right, so we've got the system installed. We've got it joined to the domain. Let's go talk about remote administration. Now, the first type of remote administration that I want to talk to you about is something called remote desktop. Remote desktop is a feature which allows an administrator to control the server's desktop from a remote client computer. Now, what this means is I can sit at a Windows 7 client computer, that's what we're gonna do here, is we're gonna allow the administrator to sit at a client computer and look at one of these servers as though they are sitting right at that server. So this is really a cool remote administration tool. Now Windows Server 2008 R2 gives you the choice of only allowing remote desktop connections from computers which support network level authentication, which will help protect the server from an attack from malicious users or software. Okay, so this is a choice. You may remember from the last lesson, we already enabled remote desktop on the server, but we said from any client. If you want, you can make this more secure, and we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to make the server more secure by changing it to only allowing connections from clients that support network level authentication. Now, when you have this enabled, in order for the client to make a connection, it must use at least the remote desktop connection version 6.0 and have support for something called the Credential Security Support Provider Protocol, or CRED SSP as it's abbreviated. Now, what does this actually do? Now, this makes it that the user actually has to be authenticated before a session is created. Okay, so it's, it's a concept of basically saying, look, only if the user is a member of the domain and can be authenticated, will we then allow this remote desktop connection? Now, I want to caution you on one thing here because there is one misconception that I've heard out there, and that is that if you have NLA enabled, only domain clients will be able to make this remote desktop connection. In other words, from a computer point of view, only the computers that have computer accounts will be able to connect, and that is false. Okay, I can tell you that you can take a computer that is not part of the domain and go ahead and attempt to make the connection. What it will do is it will prompt the user for credentials. And then as long as the user has appropriate credentials within the domain, it will then allow the connection. That's how NLA works. Now the following client operating systems meet these requirements. Windows 7, Windows Vista, and then now even Windows XP as long as it has Service Pack 3. So what is the process of enabling or having remote desktop remote administration? Well, we have to enable remote desktop connections on the servers. Okay, so we're going to go in and we're going to take a look at that first. Then we have to configure an actual remote desktop connection to each of those servers on the client. Okay, so we're going to start off going to Windows Server 2008 and enabling remote desktop connections. Then we're going to go back to Windows 7 and create an actual remote desktop connection to each of our servers, New York DC1 and New York DC2. And then we're going to create a shortcut on the client's desktop to, well, there's two things it'll do. One, it gives easy access because it's right there on the desktop. It's just an icon to click on. But two, we have the ability to actually save credentials so that you're not prompted every single time. Now, this may not be quite as secure, but it's way more convenient. Well, let's go ahead and let's take a look at this, and then I'll kind of explain that a little more detail as far as the, 
the security aspect of things when we get to the creating of that actual shortcut. Okay, so here we are on New York DC1, and the way we look at our remote desktop connections or the settings for our remote desktop connections is to click Start, right-click Computer, and go to Properties, which, of course, once again, is going to take us into our System Control Panel. And then here we have Remote Settings. So if I click on Remote Settings, down here is Remote Desktop, and you may recall from the last lesson, this is where we changed it to allowing connections from computers running any version of Remote Desktop. Okay, and we did this because we didn't know if we wanted to have users being able to connect in from any computer, especially since we still have Windows XP clients out in the Dallas office. But now that Windows XP Service Pack 3 can use network level authentication, let's go ahead and put ourselves in a more secure environment. So let's allow connections only from computers running remote desktop with NLA. Now we also could go in and we could select specific users if we wanted to. If we wanted to restrict this right down to specific users who are going to make these connections. But we're not going to worry about that here because by default, domain administrator accounts are able to do remote connections. Okay, And that's fine with us. Our IT staff, the ones who need to be able to be managing the domain controller, well, they're all going to be part of the domain administrators group. So we don't need to select any specific users. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK and close this window. Now I need to switch over to New York DC2 and do the exact same thing. So now I have, I know it looks the same, but I've switched over to New York DC2. Click Start, right click Computer, Properties, Remote Settings. And once again, let's change this to allowing connections only from computers running remote desktop with network level authentication. Click OK. Close the window. OK, we have done what we need to do on the server side of things. Now let's switch over to our Windows 7 client. OK, here we are on our Windows 7 client. And again, remember, we're already logged in as the Global Mantics Administrator. That's where we last left off. And what we're going to do is create an actual remote desktop connection to New York DC1. So I'm going to click Start, All Programs, Accessories, and here you'll find Remote Desktop Connection. In here, I can give either the name or IP address of the computer I'm trying to connect to. So I'm going to put in New York DC1 2K8. That's the actual name of the computer. And I'm going to, well, first, let's just try to connect. Let's see if this works. So I'll click Connect. And now it wants to prompt me for my credentials because we're using network level authentication. So I'll go ahead and put in the password for the Global Mantics Administrator. Now, it's defaulting to Global Mantics Administrator because that's who I'm currently logged in as. OK, well, it'll default to that account. If you weren't logged in as a domain account, well, then it would just prompt you for an account without defaulting to anything. So I'm going to click OK. And it's making an attempt to make this connection. And there we go. We are now looking at the desktop of New York DC1. How do we know this? Well, there's a little tab at the top here that tells us we're on New York DC1. Also, you'll notice the desktop looks a little different. Doesn't look like Windows 7 anymore. Also, if I were to click on Start, uh, you'll notice there's Active Directory Users and Computers and DNS. If I were to right-click Computer and go to Properties, you'll see here that it tells me I'm on New York DC1. Okay, so this is just like I'm sitting at New York DC1, but I'm not. I'm sitting at a Windows 7 client. Let me go ahead and close this window. If I were to minimize this, You'll notice that I'm still on my Windows 7 client, and down here there's an icon for the remote desktop connection for New York DC1. I mean, I could go ahead and click Start, and here's our remote desktop connection that we already use, so it appears right on the Start menu now. I click on that, and this time I put in New York DC2 2K8. Click Connect. Need to put in my password. 
Click OK. And now it makes a connection to New York DC 2. And if I minimize that, down here you'll notice I have an icon showing that I have these two connections in place and I can get to either one just by clicking on it. Boom, I'm looking at New York DC 1. Minimize that. Boom, looking at New York DC 2. Very convenient. Now, if I were to actually close this connection, and I want to tell you there's two ways you can close a connection. One is you can just click the X to disconnect or close the session, but the session will still be running. So whatever was currently happening on the machine, it'll still be happening. This is not a good idea unless you're in the middle of something. The proper way would be to click start and log off. That actually closes the connection and closes everything that's happening on the machine. It's, it's like you were actually logging out of the machine as opposed to just getting up and walking away and leaving everything running. Okay, so that's the proper way to do it. Now, even though that's the proper way, because I'm not worried about it in this particular instance, we're going to be coming right back in. I'm just going to close it. And it gives you the little warning saying this will disconnect it and everything continues running. I'll click OK. Pop back over here to New York DC1's connection. Close that one. Same warning. Click OK. You'll notice that down here when I click on Start, Remote Desktop Connection, the arrow shows me the ones that I've recently connected to. So this may be good enough. This may be all you, we want to do. And if I want to connect back up again, I just highlight this one and click Connect. Put in my credentials again. Matter of fact, I could even tell it to remember my credentials. That might be easy enough. But let's pretend like that's not easy enough. I want to create an actual shortcut on the desktop. So this time I'm going to click Start, and I'm going to go to Remote Desktop Connection. And this time, you'll notice it already populated New York DC 1, because I've been there before. But I'm going to go to Options. And this is where I can change a number of different options. I can, first of all, allow me to save my credentials. Okay, And that's, again, potential security issue, because then somebody could just go ahead and click on the icon that we're about to create here that we're going to put on the desktop and if you left your system your local client system logged in someone could walk in and now they're on the domain controller so there are potential security issues but this is definitely much more convenient I can change the display so that instead of being full screen and completely taking over my screen I could go to a smaller resolution and make this a window in a window but I don't want to do that I could change my color quality I can bring certain resources local, okay? I may want to go ahead and bring audio local, certain keyboard things, most specifically down here with local devices and resources, bring printers and clipboard. Now, clipboard is a huge one to bring local. If you wanna be able to copy paste between a, a remote machine and local machine, you have to bring the clipboard local, okay? Programs is where we can go ahead and tell it specifically to start a certain program on this particular connection. When it comes to experience, we could decide how much of the remote session do I want to bring local. You'll notice right now, things like the desktop background are not being brought local. And the reason why is because we're considered to be on a low speed connection. So we don't want to bring a whole lot of stuff. If I were to go to a LAN connection, which is what I'm on, you'll notice everything gets brought local. And we are on a LAN connection. So we'll go ahead and do that. And on advanced, this is where we could go ahead and address server authentication. Now, I don't want to get into all the details here. That's why I'm kind of going through these quickly. But when it comes to remote desktop connection, there are a number of other options that can be put in place if we're using remote desktop services or terminal services. And we could go into things like server authentication or using a remote desktop gateway. Again, I'm not going to worry you about that right now. That is something that when you learn about terminal services or remote desktop services on Windows Server 2008, we address those issues there. But the one main thing I do want to talk to you about right here under the general tab is here where you can save this connection. Okay, so now we've set everything up the way we want it. Click save as, give it a location. I'll, I'm gonna say right on the desktop and then give it a name. I'm gonna go ahead and get, say New York DC1. 
I don't even need to put the 2K8. This is just a name that I will recognize it by. So we're going to say New York DC1. Click Save. And you'll see that I now have an icon on the desktop. If I close this window, if I just simply double click this icon, now it's letting me know that we're not sure about this particular software. Okay, this is actually just a Windows 7 protection mechanism and we know what this software is so I'm gonna say don't bother me about this anymore click connect again it's gonna prompt me for my password and this time what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say remember my credentials click OK and it makes my connection I'm gonna actually close out of that connection and then I'm gonna come back up here go back to my remote desktop connection change this to New York DC 2 and go to my options allow me to save my credentials uh, the one thing that I changed was under experience I went ahead and I changed it to, to being on a LAN come back over here to general save as desktop give it the name of New York DC 2 save and again I can double click on that icon now don't bother me about that anymore connect put in my password remember my credentials click OK makes the connection I'm gonna close the connection now the reason why I'm closing the connections is I just want to show you from this point forward when I click on New York DC one this icon right here it's just gonna take me right in and it's gonna log me in even if I were to come down here and say log off If I double click New York DC one, it's going to actually connect and log me back in again. If I double click on New York DC two, it's going to connect, log me in. All right. So we have successfully set up remote management through the use of remote desktop connections with our Windows Server 2008 domain controllers and then now with our Windows 7 client. Now let's go talk about another form of remote administration. Now let's talk a little bit about something called the Remote Server Administration Tools or RSAT. Now the Remote Server Administration Tools for Windows 7 enables IT administrators to manage roles and features that are installed on remote computers that are running Windows Server 2008 R2 from a remote computer that's running Windows 7. It includes support for remote management of computers that are running either server core versions of Windows Server or the full installation options of Windows Server 2008 R2. Now I will tell you that that definition right there of the remote server administration tools is straight from Microsoft. It's actually right from Microsoft's website for these particular tools. What are these tools really? Well, basically the previous remote desktop that we looked at was where you truly take over the entire computer. You take over the entire desktop as though you are sitting at that actual machine. With the remote server administration tools, it's a much more simplified process of using the Microsoft Management Council or MMC to go ahead and use some of the tools that you would find on your server, but to use them on the client and just remotely connect to the service on the server. Now, how do we get RSAT in place on our Windows 7 client? Well, step one would be to download RSAT from Microsoft's website. And you'll see that I have a link listed here, and it's quite a lengthy one. Let me go ahead and click on it right now so you can see the website. But then I'm going to show you a, a much easier way of getting there than trying to write down or memorize this really long link. Let me go ahead and click on the link now. We'll go take a look at the website quickly here. Go ahead and expand this. So here is Microsoft's download center site for the remote server administration tools for Windows 7. 
And here you'll see there's the definition of exactly what they are. And what you'll also find on here is the literal instructions on how to get them installed, which we're going to go over in just a moment. And then down here near the bottom is where you find the two files that you would actually use. And it's you don't use both. You use one depending on what version of the operating system you're running. If you're running a 32-bit version of Windows 7, then you download the x86 edition. If you're running a 64-bit version of Windows 7, then you download the one that says AMD 64. Okay, so let me go ahead and close out of here. We'll come back to this screen in just a little bit when we're going to actually download it. But the next step would be to run the remote server administration tools for Windows 7 setup wizard. Basically, you take that file you just downloaded, you put it into a folder, and double click on it. And then from there, you get an installation wizard, and you just basically click I agree to the agreement and next a few times, and you're done. Again, we'll look at this in just a moment. Then from there, once you have installed the remote server administration tools, you have to go to the control panel where you go to your programs and features and you go to turning on or off Windows features. You expand the remote server administration tools and select the tools you want to install. Now very often what you'll end up doing, and it's what we're going to end up doing, is you just choose to install all the remote server administration tools. And the reason why is although there may be specific tools right now that you know that you have installed on the server and that you want to use for remote management, but down the road there may be additional servers or additional tools that you may want to use as well. And it really doesn't put a lot of overhead on the system to go ahead and just add all the remote server administration tools. Now the last step, and this is I'd say an optional step, is if you want to customize the start menu to include administrative tools. So why don't we just go ahead and pop back over to our Windows 7 computer and see exactly how this all works. Alright, so here we are back on our Windows 7 client computer. And the first step to installing the tools is to download them. So as I promised a few minutes ago, I'm going to show you an easier way to get to Microsoft's Download Center for this tool than writing down or memorizing a big long URL. So let me go ahead and click on Internet Explorer. It'll take us right into Google. And of course, Microsoft would prefer that we use Bing, but basically you could use whatever search engine you prefer to use. But I'm just going to go ahead and type in RSAT, and you'll see it self-populates here to RSAT Windows 7. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And the very first link takes us to the download center for this particular tool. So I'm going to click on the link, and it should take us right into that page. And here we go, the Microsoft Download Center for the Remote Server Administration Tools for Windows 7. I'm going to click on the link here, it says Download Files Below, it takes us right down to the two files. Now because I'm running a 64-bit version of Windows 7, I'm going to go ahead and choose the top one here to download. So let me go ahead and click on that button. And here I choose whether I want to open or save the file. I'm going to go ahead and say I want to save it. And then I'm going to put right on the desktop, I'm going to go ahead and let me right click here, new folder, and I'll just name it RSAT. Go into that folder and click save. Now, depending on the speed that Microsoft's Download Center is sending you the file and or the speed or the bandwidth of your own internet, as you can see, this file is over 200 megabytes, so it might take a little while. It looks like it's going to take about eight minutes on my end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording of this lesson. And as usual, if you're following along, you pause as well. And I will resume as soon as we're done downloading the file. All right, so the download is complete. And so I'm going to go ahead and click Close and then go ahead and close Internet Explorer. And here on the desktop is our folder. It says RSAT. If I double click and go inside that folder, here you find the file. This is just the installation file. So I'm going to double click on that file. 
and it'll take just a moment while it prepares for the installation. And here you'll see it's searching for updates and because this is considered to be a Windows update. So it's asking, do I want to install the following Windows software update? Okay, this is the actual tool. So I'm gonna say, yes, I do wanna do this. So it's copying the packages to the Windows update cache. And this is, this is really, it's, it's, it's funny, it's, it's doing everything the same way it would if this was something that came through Windows update. But because this is not a mandatory update, this is an optional one, it has a little wizard that goes with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and accept the license terms. And now it's going to go ahead and initialize this installation. So it'll take just a moment. Okay, the installation has completed, and this window that you see that has opened here, this opens automatically. It's nothing that I did. Uh, it's just basically the help file for how to install or remove the remote server administration tools. And this is gonna go in and talk about how you go into control panel, go into programs and features, and turn features on or off, just like I was talking about. So let me go ahead and I'm gonna close this window. And you'll see in the background, this is where you had the installation complete for the downloading and installing of updates. Looks like, looks like we just did a Windows update. Well, we basically did. I'm gonna go ahead and click close. And we can close this window. Now at this point, we actually can go ahead and delete this folder and the installation file that's in it unless of course we want to go ahead and share it and maybe have this file available to install on other computers but that that is something that's you know a choice based upon how many other machines we may want to do this to but I'm gonna go ahead and delete this folder because we're not going to need it anymore yep delete it all right now let's go ahead and click start go into control panel go into programs and then go into programs and features and in here this is where we find the link for turn windows features on or off let me click on that it'll take just a moment while it figures out what features are currently on and currently are off and what's been installed in this machine and right down here you'll see the remote server administration tools if I expand it you'll see that there are feature administration tools role administration tools server manager Okay, I can continue expanding. Okay, just keep expanding down, expanding down. There's there's all sorts of tools that we have here. Okay, it's quite a list. See, here's the top remote server. And you, you got a list here of a number of different tools all the way down. So you, the bottom one is this server manager. So what I'd like to do is, see, I'd like to be able to just go ahead and click here to go ahead and do all of them. Uh, but it's not going to let me do that okay it really wants you to go through and pick the ones that you're going to use so just to pick one as an example one that i know that we may want to remotely administrate would be the dns server tools right because we already have dns server installed out on our domain controllers you know speaking of our domain controllers you'll notice there are some active directory domain services tools but not all of them Okay, so like as for instance, here's ADDS snap-ins and command line tools. Let's check that one. Okay, let's see what that does. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and select those two for right now and go ahead and click OK. And again, it'll just take a moment here while it actually adds the tools to this machine. And then we're going to go in and actually operate one of these tools. All right, so it is complete. Let me go ahead and close out of the control panel here. Now there's one other step that I said we need to do and that's an optional step. You'll notice if I click on start, I already have my administrative tools on the start menu, but this is going to depend on the version of Windows 7 that you're running, okay? So basically I wanna show you if I, if I right click on the start menu and go to properties and then go to customize if I scroll down here through the list here we have our system administrative tools I already have it displayed on the all programs menu and on the start menu I could make it that it's not directly on the start menu I could make it that it's not here I could make it that I have to go to all programs and then find administrative tools okay or I could say no I don't want you to display it at all but I have it displayed on the all programs menu and the start menu. 
Okay, so we're already set up as far as that goes. I just wanted to show you how to get it there if you don't already have it listed. And again, it has to do with the version of Windows 7 you're running and this actual, it actually happened as part of this installation, but it doesn't happen all the time. So anyway, let me go ahead and click on start and go to administrative tools. And you'll notice that what I have here is DNS. That's an important one. And if I click on that, it want to know what DNS server I want to go ahead and manage. So I'm going to go ahead and say I want to manage New York DC1 2K8. Click OK. And if I expand New York DC1 2K8, here's my forward lookup zones. Let me go ahead and expand this. And here's my SRV resource records. Here's globalmantics.local. Okay, so as you can see here, I can remotely manage DNS from my Windows 7 client. If I close out of this utility, click Start, go to Administrative Tools, Active Directory Users and Computers, it jumps right into managing globalmantics.local because that is the domain that I'm a member of. If I expand that, you'll see here, built in, there's computers, see, the computer container, there's my computer account, okay, domain controller, see my two domain controller accounts, just so you can see I'm actually looking at globalmantics.local from my Windows 7 client. All right, so let me go ahead and close out of there. And, well, that pretty much is the two main utilities that I want to show you, remote desktop and the remote server administration tools. So let's pop back and talk about what we've learned in this lesson. So in this lesson, we started off by taking a look at our company Global Mantics here and looking at the needs, which was to provide remote administration to the IT managers so that they don't have to always go into the server room every time they have to manage one of our servers. We saw how to install a Windows 7 client computer and just like with Windows Server 2008, Microsoft has really simplified this process. No real big deal there. Then we joined that client to the domain. So we made the Windows 7 client part of the globalmantics.local domain. Then we went into our servers, we went back to the domain controllers and enabled remote desktop, or as you may recall, we enabled the generic remote desktop in the previous lesson, but we, what we did here was we modified it to only allowing connections from clients supporting network level authentication so that we have a more secure environment when it comes to remote connections. Then we went back over to the Windows 7 client and created a remote desktop connection to each of the two domain controllers that we have right now, New York DC1 and New York DC2. And I also showed you how to go ahead and save a shortcut on the desktop and be able to save the credentials and different options as far as the look of the connection and things like that. That just kind of simplifies the overall process of making that connection, not having to worry about whether remote desktop connections is still convenient on the start menu, which by the way, that's another way that you could do it. You could just pin that tool to the start menu and then it would always be there. And as we saw, you'll have a built-in shortcut to any recent connections that we had. So there's a number of different options when it comes to these remote desktop connections and being able to get to them quickly and easily. And then we wrap things up by looking at another remote management tool called the remote server administration tools. Now, the one thing that I, I really wanna mention is you may have seen that the remote server administration tools was something that was nice and easy. It's just a Windows update. It's actually part of the Windows operating system basically. And it allows us a quick and easy way to get to certain management utilities. But I want to emphasize that although yes, it's true that that is a quick and easy way and and maybe is less intrusive than having to actually go through the full remote desktop connection, and actually look at the full desktop of the server. But you can't do everything from RSAT. And that's where remote desktop really comes into place. If there is some form of management that there's not a remote tool for, well, you'll be able to do it from remote desktop because 
via remote desktop, you can do pretty much anything and everything. And the reason why? Well, it's because you're, it, it, it's as though you're sitting at the actual machine. Now, the only thing that I've personally found that you have limitations with when it comes to remote management via remote desktop is if you are doing things that either A, involve disabling or changing of your network connection or configuration, because since you're connected across the network, if, if let's say you have to go into the server and change its IP address, well, then temporarily you're going to get disconnected because you're connected via the old IP address. So as soon as you make that change, boom, you're out. The other reason is when it comes to rebooting of the machine. If you're going to do something that involves a reboot, well, again, while it's rebooting, you're going to be kicked out. Although the reality is, if you think about it, if you were sitting at the actual server and you rebooted, well, you're kicked out during the reboot anyway. Okay, so anyway, those are the two primary ways of doing remote management, RSAT, remote desktop, and now you know how to do them. So that's all I have for you in this lesson, and I'll see you in the next one.